uh, again to the book of Isaiah where we've been doing our studies. So I would invite you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. We'll probably spend uh, several weeks here in this most important chapter. Uh, some would say the most important chapter in Isaiah. I don't know, it's pretty hard to, to determine that. There's so many good chapters in Isaiah, you know, uh, the high and lifted up throne room scene. Uh, there's just so many. Chapter 12, drinking will, water from the wells of salvation. Chapter 35 and on and on. Um, but it is, of course, a very significant chapter. And uh, so let's, uh, let's read part of it this morning and let's uh, ask God to bless us in our understanding. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Would you pray with me? Lord, your word is eternal. It's good. It's righteous. It is more important than our daily bread. It is better for us than silver and gold. Help us to approach it that way and see it and understand it. And may it fill every crevice of our lives as we meditate upon it day and night and thus find good success. And so, Lord, open it to us this morning. And may the voice of Jesus speak through it to us. In his name we pray. Amen. This is actually a rather little complicated chapter on on. On the face of it, sometimes it's, it's very simplistic, but it's a prophecy, which of course comes seven, six or seven hundred years before it gets fulfilled, and yet the whole chapter, for the most part, is written in the past tense. Did you catch that as you read through that? It's talking about the future, but in the past, as if it had already come, come to pass. So, so there's that sort of... A strange aspect of how this, this passage unfolds there. But also, at the same time it being a prophecy, it's sort of an accusation against people who will not believe. Or is it a confession of those who have come to trust the truth of it and trust in the Lord Jesus. So you see all those sort of interwoven things in this just one chapter of the scriptures that God had sent out through the prophet Isaiah there. So let's uh, approach it by asking a few questions first. First of all, what would you say is the overall theme of this chapter? And I think it's pretty clear that the theme of the chapter is suffering. Horrible suffering, terrible suffering, traumatic suffering, agonizing suffering, painful, deadly suffering. Suffering is clearly the theme of this chapter as you read it all the way through there. Verse 3 says he's a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Verse 4, he, he himself bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was pierced through. He was crushed. Verse 5, he was chastised. Verse 6, the Lord has caused the iniquity of him to fall, of us to fall on him. Verse 7, he was oppressed. He was a lamb to the slaughter. Verse 8, he experienced oppression and judgment. He was cut off from the land of the living. All of this indicates terrible suffering and 
and I suppose that that could lead to another question, was this suffering deserved? I mean, there's lots of suffering in the world, and some of it is well-deserved because it's brought on by evil, okay? But was this sufferer, the one who's being described in this chapter, deserving of it? And the answer, of course, is no. Go back to verse 9 there. At the end of the verse it says, He has done no violence, and there was no deceit found in his mouth. In fact, we could, uh, he's called the righteous one. So on, <clears throat> in answering the question, is, is it a deserved suffering? The answer is obviously no. This one who suffers is righteous. He has done no violence. And the, a, a third question that you might pose to this chapter is, did God attempt to protect this sufferer? And the answer, of course, is uh, no. Verse 10 says in the chapter, God was pleased to crush him putting him to grief. So you have this amazing story of, of uh, suffering, unparalleled suffering, undeserved suffering by a righteous sufferer who is unprotected by the righteous God from that suffering, which leads us to maybe another question in this chapter. Is that a failure on God's part? Is that inconsistent with who God is in his righteous nature? And the answer to that is no. In verse 5 it says, He was pierced through for our transgressions. The cause of this suffering was not <clears throat> ultimately God just letting things happen, but suffering came because of us. He was pierced. Through our, because of our trans. In verse 6, the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. At the end of verse 8, for the transgression of my people, he was cut off out of the land of the living. And then the, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm piling the questions up, but the chapter begins with questions too, so I feel I can add a few. Why would a man do that? Why should any man who is righteous, suffers so horribly and suffers so, so long and even unto death, for what reason? And the answer is because he was willing. In verse 10, it says, he would render himself a guilt offering. So this one who suffers is willingly going, undergoing all this horribleness that we see laid out in this chapter there. Why does he do that? Well, in verse 11 it says, he will, by doing that, will justify many. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge, shall my righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous there, and he shall bear their iniquities. Well, obviously, then, the next question is, who is this? And we know, and then the, the church has said throughout, throughout all time now, this is Jesus. We know because of the detail of this chapter how it fits only one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> well, but we return to verse 1 there where it says, but... Who has believed what he has heard from us and whom, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, of, of course, this all came to the Jewish people first there when Jesus came to the earth. And it's a staggering thought that they wouldn't believe it. I mean, they had Isaiah 53. They had like the preview of all this that was coming upon the Messiah. They had it for hundreds and hundreds of years in their scriptures. And yet, when Jesus comes to bring salvation, comes as the, the suffering servant, they don't believe the good news of salvation. They don't believe 
in the crucified Savior. They don't take in to themselves the fact that they were guilty sinners and that they can now stand before the holy God because he has carried their grease and bared their sins. Why? Why would they not believe that? And it's a good question for us this morning too. Why? Why will the world not look at this Jesus and simply fall at his feet? Well, the first uh, verses here give us some reasons for that, uh, especially verse uh, 2 and 3. Let's look at that in our chapter there. It says, For he grew up before him like a plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should dis desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteem him not. Well, one reason why Isaiah gives an explanation of why people reject Jesus is because of contempt. They have contempt for him as a person. He doesn't seem to be the Savior kind of man. He doesn't seem to be, as we talked last week in the last week's sermon, meet people's expectations. And that's actually kind of found in the text here because it says in verse 2, For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. The, the actual Hebrew word here for that word branch, uh, I'm not going to try and pronounce it this morning for you, but... Uh, uh, it actually means a sucker branch. Now, do you know what a sucker branch is? That's, that's like something that comes up that wasn't intended there. And in the gardening world, in the tree world, what you do with those is you whack them off there. So what, what the prophet is describing is that when people look at Jesus, they see this contemptible, superfluous, small, unnecessary, irrelevant, insignificant sucker branch that pops up out of the dry ground. He was a nobody from nowhere. I mean, he had no connections. He was born in a stable. He flees to Egypt. He comes back later and lives in Nuego. I'm sorry, not Nuego, Nazareth. <laughs> someplace out of the way with no powerful people there. He's a sucker branch. He's irrelevant and unwanted and unimpressive there. And that gave rise to all kinds of, uh, you know, can call them nothing less than blasphemies on the part of the Jewish people because they looked at him and then they rejected him as Messiah and then they had to make excuses for why they wouldn't follow this Messiah. But that was typical of the Jewish people because that was in their history. You remember when they wanted a king, who did they choose? They looked for this tall, good-looking guy by the name of Saul, who was, of course, a disaster in the end, but he fit the profile. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. And people look for saviors in our world today who, who seem powerful, who seem prominent, who seem uh, great in every sense of the world. But Jesus was not that way. He was like this young plant growing up out of a dry place in the world. No significant achievements. Oh, they acknowledged his wisdom. They acknowledged the things that he taught. They acknowledged the miracles that he did. But then they would say, but isn't this guy just the son of the carpenter? Son of Mary, 
brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, aren't his sisters with us? They took offense at him there. They were offended by his claim to be their Messiah. Secondly, they had contempt for his life, for his adulthood, for, for his own, own majesty. The scriptures here say he had no stately form or majesty that we should look at him. He came claiming to have a kingdom, which of course means that he's claiming to be a king. And yet he didn't fit the profile of any king, rides into the Jerusalem on a donkey. Whenever they try and make him king, he slips away. <laughs> and then there's the sort of the, the final uh, in, uh, in human sort of thought is that when he's on the cross, what do they ride over top of them? The king of the Jews there. Now that was Pilate who did that. He was probably making a little dig at him. Because you see, that was his most significant claim to be the Messiah, to be the king. And yet the people of his day said, we don't believe in him. Remember when the people came back from the temple, the guards, they were sent to take Jesus captive and they came back because and they didn't do it. And they said to the leaders, well, the leader said to them, why, why didn't you take this man captive? He said, well, nobody ever said, nobody ever spoke like he did. And what was their answer? Do, do any of the leaders believe him? Do any of the people in the know, in power, believe him? You see, they were too self-righteous. They thought they were okay on their, end, on their own. They should have seen that Jesus was the Messiah. They should have seen from their own sacrificial system. But they were looking at the wrong expectations again. Let's stop there just a minute, though. Because there are all kinds of people in the world today that are just like them. They see Jesus, and when they see Jesus, they might call him a good teacher. But he's still a nobody to them. You see, it's not enough to acknowledge the historicity of Jesus. It's not enough to acknowledge that he was a, a, a fabulous teacher. If you stop there, you stop short of who he is. And you're looking at him in purely human terms. The rabbis tried to justify themselves as to why they didn't accept Jesus. Uh, and they created all kinds of stories. And one story, kind of blasphemous, is that he was the son of a hairdresser and a Roman mercenary. That comes out of the Talmud there. Others, uh, that they even changed his name. Uh, the, the name for, in Hebrew for Jesus is Yeshua. And they changed it. If you look at the rabbinic writings, they, 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 lop, they lop off the last letter. They call him Yeshu, which is an acrostic from their understanding for the words, let his name be blotted out. They were st strongly rejecting this. They also call him the transgressor, the tolu, the hanged ones, and uh, they call the gospel those evil writings. But we shouldn't be surprised by that because it says here, he was, dis in verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men. And that's an interesting formulation there in the Hebrew because it doesn't use the regular word for men, which is Adam. Remember the first guy who was born? That's the Hebrew word for men, also in the Hebrew. But this is ish. And, uh, and ish is more, it, it tends to be a word used about men who are more important men. 
which is exactly kind of how the story went in Jesus' life. The, the important ones despised him. They rejected him. They didn't esteem him. A sufferer doesn't fit their picture. A crown of thorns, a death on the cross, that doesn't fit their picture of a Messiah. They were ashamed of someone like that. But then you come to Paul in the New Testament, and of course he was a rejecter at the beginning as well. But then he sees, he goes on the road to Damascus and he sees Jesus for who he really is. That King and Lord, the Son of God, Son of Man, as we sang in the hymn here this morning. And he falls to his knees in repentance and, and he is no longer ashamed of this man. In fact, what does he write in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16? He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because he's finally seeing the true Jesus for who he is and what he has done there. Peter, in his first sermon to the Jews, accused him of this very thing. He says, you're the ones who rejected him. You disowned the holy and the righteous one in Acts chapter 3. You asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is in the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man, they're talking about the miracle, that it was just healed, whom you see and know, and that faith which comes through him has given him the perfect health in the presence of you all. He says, you've rejected, you take the responsibility. Now take responsibility for your rejecting and putting to death the prince of life. You acted in ignorance, Peter goes on to say there. But the days of ignorance are over now. You might say, well, they were caught up in their time and in their culture and in their expectations. They had this long tradition of what the Messiah was uh, going to be. And, and in, in a human perspective, maybe it was understandable what they did, that they did it in, in a bit of ignorance. But those days are past. It's now time to come to grips with the reality of who Jesus is, to see him in all of his fullness, which uh, we'll, we'll see in the next verses of this chapter. He is the Savior. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. The people of Jesus' day and Paul's day and of the 21st century have to come to grips with the despised suffering one and has to have to see beyond that part of it to the reality of the wholeness of what Jesus has done, that he has come to become our Savior and to be our Savior, and that that is the road of the true king down through the valley of suffering and up into his exaltation. Then, Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, Open our hearts if they've not been opened to see Jesus, not only as the suffering servant, but as the triumphant Savior that you have made him. And may that be so powerful in our own hearts that we would overflow 
with rivers of living water to other people as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.